Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really excited about this presentation today, Walking in Two Worlds, Understanding the Impact of Historical and Intergenerational Trauma on a Two-Spirit Native LGBT Community. Um, what I'm going to do first before beginning the presentation, I have asked one of a well-respected elder in our community to do an opening for us. Kathleen? Good afternoon, Tosca. Thank you for asking me. And hello, everybody. Hope you're having a very good day. This is Sheena Ikikumi, Takes the Road Woman. My name is, English name is Ethleen Iron Cloud Two Dogs. I'm Oglala Lakota and also have Crow ancestry. I reside on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in Porcupine, South Dakota. So happy that this information is being brought to you. It's so important. Um, uh, I am uh, really looking forward to this. And uh, uh, thank you again for asking me to do the opening. So thank among you. the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota people, then we have um, you know, a protocol. And one of the protocols, part of the protocol is to ask the creator for a blessing upon whatever we're going to do. So we don't start anything without that uh, blessing. So in my language, in my Lakota language, then I will share that um, opening. Thank you so much again, Lenny um, Tosha. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And now we have a short video that we're going to share um, that Lenny has created. It's his digital story. And so for those of you on the phone, quick reminder just to make sure your lines are muted. Um, and if this doesn't work for your connection for any reason, we are sharing the link to the video on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. So you should see that link to the YouTube video. And if you can't see or hear it very well, it's a three-minute video. You can save that link and watch it um, from your own desktop at any time. So I'm going to go ahead and start that video now. Thank you. I did not begin my healing journey until I was 29 years old. At that time, I attempted suicide and almost succeeded. It was very painful having to learn how to deal and cope with the trauma I experienced as a child. During my healing process, I became in touch with my child within. I imagined my little boy sitting in a corner with his head down with tattered clothes and messed up hair. My second stage of healing was standing beside my little boy and holding his hand. My third stage of healing was becoming one with him as an elder in my tribal community saying a healing ceremonial song over me. She reminded me to, to address and talk with that old boy. I said to him, you took care of me and now it's my turn to take care of you. My name is Lenny and I'm from the Sisseton Wapiton Oyate of the northeast corner of South Dakota. I was born in 1969 in Sisseton, South Dakota. I was awarded the tribal court system from the age of 10 to 17, in which at that time I was emancipated by the court system. At the age of 10, I was sitting in a court with my social worker and she told me that my mother's parental rights were taken away. I looked at her and said, what does that mean? She replied, she is no longer your mother legally and can't make decisions for you. I left feeling lost, lonely, sad, and confused. Before being emancipated, I came from an alcoholic home in which I experienced physical, mental, emotional, and sexual abuse. When being removed, I went to a boarding school, to a foster home, a group home, a detention center, and even jail. I can now say as an adult that the tribal protection program system failed me. They were more focused on my sexual identity as a young gay boy instead of the trauma I experienced as a child. What I experienced as a child does not define who I am today. 
I am a proud Two-Spirit individual who is connected with my Two-Spirit community, my Dakota culture, and my spirituality. I am now a mental health therapist in which I'm helping children, adults, Native people, and Two-Spirit LGBTQ individuals. I am giving back to the universe. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you. So as, so as an Indian person, we always talk about <clears throat> uh, uh, introducing ourselves. Well, you, you got a little information of who I am. Um, I am from the Sistan Wapton Oyate, over the northeast corner of South Dakota. I am founder and owner of Tate Toba Consulting. Um, I do have my own private practice. But what I've been doing nationally is a lot of work in regards to Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ identity. Um, today I come um, standing with my ancestors, uh, my Two-Spirit friends, my relatives across the country who are also doing work um, to bring a lot of uh, positive change to our community. Um, we really struggle. And so that today what I'm going to talk about is how historical trauma has impacted our community. Um, I also want to say that I define myself as a first, a Winkta. That was a name that was given to me from my own uh, tribal community. Second, I call myself a two-spirit male. And lastly, I call myself a gay male. Um, so, and that's who I am. Um, I am a survivor of uh, child sexual, physical, and mental abuse. Um, I'm a survivor of the foster care system. And so for me, doing this work, it's really important to um, that we be really inclusive to this community. But one of the questions I always ask uh, LGBTQ organizations or anyone who speaks of Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ people, um, youth, one of the questions I always ask them is, um, so what does that inclusive look like? Um, does it mean just adding the label to the LGBTQ? Or does it really mean truly understanding what it means to be two-spirit? Because for me, defining myself as a two-spirit male, it is my connection to culture and spirituality. Um, so it goes way deeper than a label. Um, so as I go along, I'm going to talk a lot about how colonization has changed our way of thinking and how we view this population, um, our relatives. And so um, I'm hoping. Um, that you get some understanding. I am going to be talking a little bit more of the uh, basic 101 um, because it goes much deeper. And I'm really honored and, um, and humbled and blessed to have been able to sit with many Two-Spirit relatives in different capacities. Um, and I really want to acknowledge my Two-Spirit elders, my elders in the community, that if there's anything that I may say or do um, that may hurt you or upset you, um, I ask for apology. Um, I really, really work, to, really work hard to uh, create some positive change for our community and that we are included. So again, um, I, I come with a good heart and I acknowledge all the people who stand with me. So we're going to do a poll. So one of the things that I always like to ask individuals, because I go across the country training in tribal communities, and one of the questions um, that I usually like to ask uh, Native people is, do you know the specific term in your language that would describe someone like me? So if you could please uh, uh, participate in a poll, um, if you know, um, let us know. If you don't, it's okay. It's not. It's not a bad thing. I just like to ask that question. Do you know the specific term in your language that would describe someone like me? Uh, 
and we'll just wait a few minutes. Okay. Well, it looked like there was a high percentage of individuals who um, didn't know um, the word in their language um, that would describe an individual like me. Um, I recently sat with an elder um, and um, heard some news, which I'm probably going to end up doing some more research and. Um, um, talking with more elders, but what I was told in the Dakota culture, um, the word winkta is probably not the original word, and so that was used to describe someone like me, um, and really truly understanding how colonization has changed our way of thinking and has even changed our language, and so I found that quite surprising when I heard that, um, so that just pushes me to do, do some more further research even within my own tribal community. I have asked if there's any um, history that's been written about Winkta's or if there's any pictures, um, but nothing has been found yet. So um, that's, you know, it's, it's quite um, disturbing um, in a sense. So what I know and what I've been taught um, in my own research and having to sit and talk with individuals in different communities, when we talk about cultural terms to identify um, us and gender, there's a quite a number of tribes who do have a specific word that they use in their tribal community to describe someone like me, either a male or both male and female. Um, it's really important to understand that each tribe um, has a specific word that they use. It may be lost. Some people may know it. Um, but it's also important to remember, too, that not all tribes connect to the word two-spirit. Um, I will go into a little more of that history in some upcoming slides. But I always remind people that not all tribal communities connect to that term two-spirit. Uh, because it's it's seen differently in, in different tribes. So I always remind people that it's important to ask people how they identify. We can't assume that maybe some, someone, a brown person, maybe uh, LGBTQ, or um, they may not connect with that term two-spirit. Um, and that's okay. That, you know, that's not a big thing. But often, what I always talk about is that sometimes we place these labels on individuals without asking them, how do you identify? That is the most important piece. Um, so for instance, I always talk about my Navajo friends, my Navajo colleagues. Um, I always tell them that I envy because they know a lot of their history uh, about their um, Native LGBTQ people. The Navajo people do not connect to that term two-spirit because in their culture it means something different. I love that they they um, they know that um, and and be respectful about that. But what we can't do either is that we cannot um, uh, place judgment on individuals or look down on individuals who call themselves two-spirit because what we're doing when we do that is that we're shaming them. And we need to stop doing that. We need to stop shaming people. But we need to also allow people to identify who they are. So these cultural terms um, from different tribes, the term and the gender, is just part of what we know about our history. What I also want to tell, remind people, too, is that I am talking at a universal, in a universal way. I'm not talking specifically about one tribe, either. Um, so. Like I said, I'm just giving a basic understanding because um, I'm still learning. I tell people that all the time. I am not, you know, 
the the person who knows everything about true spirit identity. I know what was taught to me, um, even just sitting along with uh, true spirit people and true spirit elders. Here are some also some uh, cultural terms to identify from different tribes also. Um, so there is tribes who know their words uh, to identify someone like me, um, which is amazing. Good question. So I have a question so far. Clarify, does the term true spirit, identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, or both identify? Well, it is different in different communities. Um, I think often some people will just like, they see it in one community and they grasp onto it and they say it's across the board, but it's different in each uh, tribal community. So I'm gonna go a little bit more into the um, uh, identity in a couple more slides, so please be patient. One of the questions that I like to ask, so. Uh, a lot of people, this is a famous picture of um, out in Pennsylvania, the boarding school, the first boarding school. So research tells us that one out of 10 individuals identifies as LGBTQ. That's what research has told us. So one of the questions when I go into tribal communities and um, view this picture, I've had conversations with uh, some of my colleagues who identify and one of the things that we had a deep discussion about is how many of those children do you think possibly may have been native LGBTQ or true spirit? That is a really, really interesting question to ponder because back then, um, as I get into more of the history of two spirit people, um, just imagine what was wiped away from these children who identified. So we're gonna do a second poll question before I uh, get further into um, the identity piece. So this question is asked, were you taught anything about two-spirit people in your tribal communities? And second, it's gonna be a two-piece uh, poll question. Was it good or bad? So again, were you taught anything about two-spirit people in your tribal communities? And was it good or was it bad? Well, it looks like in some communities it was um, um, it was good. A high percentage, but there's also a high percentage of no that they weren't taught anything about two spirit people. So how about we go to the next one? Let's go to the next poll. So was it good or was it bad? So what were you taught? Was it good or was it bad? Go ahead and just be a part of this poll if you can. All right. So let me tell you what two-spirit means. So it's a direct translation of the Ojibwe term. I'm not even going to attempt to pr um, pronounce that because I know that I won't do well in pronouncing that, but the direct translation, from the, it comes from the direct translation of Ojibwe term. Um, and what it means is that the person uh, holds, houses both a male and female spirit. So when we talk about the native perspective, the term can also be used more as 
abstractly to indicate the presence of two contrasting human spirits, such as the warrior and the clan mother. So where did the two-spirit two uh, term emerge from? Well, it came about in 1990 at a um, Intertribal Native American First Nations Gay and Lesbian uh, Conference in Winnipeg. And what had happened was these individuals came together to have like discussion about um, um, sort of stepping away from that mainstream LGBT, LGBTQ I identity. And so remember, you know, we have over what, uh, 560 some tribes in the United States and with over 200 languages. So these people came together um, my two spirit relatives came together and they wanted to come up with one specific word, um, two spirit. And as I said earlier, for me, the two spirit identity means my connection to culture and spirituality. So it was sort of a sense in having that kind of conversation because they really wanted to get away from the mainstream LGBTQ. Um, though we must remember that it is okay for native individuals to identify as native LGBTQ. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, so please know that I'm not um, being judgmental or whatever. Um, but to remember that, you know, each individual has the right to identify who they are. Um, the third gender, so we have the uh, male and female heterosexual genders, but when we talk about the, the third gender, we talk about the male, the male two-spirit. And the fourth gender would be the female two-spirit. Um, so today we would, moder in modern day, we would call it uh, the third gender a gay male. The fourth gender would be a female a lesbian. It has been said that when a person is given the gift of being two-spirit, it means that the individual has the ability to see the world in two different perspectives at the same time. That's a really, really powerful, powerful quote, um, because I do believe that. Um, I always like to sort of um, joke around about my identity as a two-spirit male. And what I say is that um, often my spirit goes back and forth. I present as more feminine, and so I always say that my feminine spirit is much more stronger than my male spirit. But I always tell people, I can carry wood, too. I could be butch, and, you know, and that's okay to laugh. Um, but that is how I view things, and I like to share that with people. But it's always, always important to remember that what I'm saying is always not truth. It is what I believe, but I've had conversations with people who identify, and um, very powerful conversations. And um, it's always good just to have conversation with people who identify and how they see and view things. Um, Alex Wilson, um, a two-spirit woman activist and educator, wrote that the term two-spirit proclaims a sexuality that's deeper rooted in our own cultures. Two-spirit identity affirms the interrelatedness of all aspects of identity, including sexuality, gender, culture, community, and spirituality. So I love this quote, and I love learning from the people who have done this work before me. Um, so I admire them. I have high respect for them um, in the work that they've done. Will Roscoe writes that uh, male and female two-spirits have been documented in over 130 tribes in every region of North America among every type of Native culture. It is very important to remember that genders vary from tribe to tribe, but are similar. It is also said that some tribes have, a, have up to 15 genders to, genders to identify two-spirit individuals. It's also important to remember that the term two-spirit is a Native American concept and should only be used by Native Americans who identify. Um, when I do training across the country, that's one of the things that I tell people is that if you know or hear of a non-Native person calling them two-spirit, please correct them. 
um, I've presented um, at different um, capacities, but one of them I presented at a, um, for upcoming therapists, and um, I had a non-native individual who identified as a lesbian woman um, who kept wanting to grasp onto that two-spirit um, term, asking why she couldn't call herself two-spirit. And one of the things I said to her was, um, and I was very respectful in that. I didn't, I, I'm never mean when I talk about this stuff. I never try to be really aggressive, but I always remind people that, um, so what I said to her was, do you know what has happened to Indian people? Do you know about historical and intergenerational trauma? And most of the time they, they know, um, most of the time I encourage them to research and to truly understand um, that Native people have had a lot of things taken away from them. And one of the things that I said to her was, um, this was a concept that was created by Native people. You can't have it. And like I said, I said that in a very respectful way because often, you know, um, because of colonization, a lot of things are still um, being taken away from us or um, being used by individuals who shouldn't be using um, our words or um, in identifying themselves. So before colonization, our two-spirit people, our two-spirit Native LGBTQ people, um, they played important roles in their tribal community. Um, they were healers and medicine people. They were parents of orphaned children. Uh, they were conveyors of oral tradition and song. They were foretellers of the future, name givers, nurses, potters, matchmakers, makers of feather regalia. And they played special roles in Sundance. So one of the things that I like to talk about, too, is that I have two, two very good male and female two-spirit individuals who have their own Sundance in South Dakota. And I have, I have such high respect for them um, because they are being a part of ceremony um, today, in modern day. Um, what I tell people about myself and my community role, you know, I've always um, fantasized and always imagined what would it have been like for me as a two-spirit or a winkta before colonization? I often think how beautiful that would have been. Um, but what I say to people today is that I work with people, I sit with people, I hear their truth. So today I could, um, or even before colonization, I could have been considered a healer or a medicine person because I'm helping people. And for me, that, that's such a great honor. Um, I love the work that I do. Um, I am currently in private practice, and I have chosen to work with individuals, both youth and adults, who identify, because I feel like this, our, my community is such an underserved um, community. Um, we're underrepresented, um, and so I want to work with my people and help my people. So I do strongly believe that I am a healer, a medicine person today, in modern day. So history tells us, you know, two-spirit native LGBT, LGBTQ people have been around. Here's Wiwa. Um, I love talking about Wiwa. She comes from the Zuni people. Um, she was an ambassador to her people to the United States government. Um, she traveled to Washington, D.C., represented her people. Um, she would be what we would call today a male to female transgender. Um, one of the things that I know is that before colonization, we didn't have those words, LGBTQ. Um, I've, I've talked with people, um, I've heard in some tribal communities that they, they never had words like that. So, that. so really think about how colonization has changed the way that we think. Um, here is uh, Hosting Kla from the Diné. Here's Pine Leaf Woman, another one that I love to talk about. Uh, she was actually a chief amongst the Crow people. She would be what we would call a lesbian uh, in modern day terms. Um, even though she did the roles of um, male, she was not transgender. She would, she would be what we would call today a lesbian.
Here's also a picture of a uh, female two spirits, male two spirits. And this is a two spirit in which we would say female to male. Two spirit people were treated with the utmost respect and honor before colonization. So, what has happened to honor and respect? So what I know of and what I've been told through research and talking with individuals, um, out of the love and respect for Two-Spirit people, many chiefs were reluctant to defend their Two-Spirit people when they, and they were sent underground to protect them because the Europeans and the missionaries were actually coming in and murdering our Two-Spirit people. Um, Two-spirit people and their community roles were forgotten due to historical and intergenerational trauma. So with that, um, what I say about that is that um, because of colonization and them coming in, because from my understanding, um, and like I said, I'm not um, going to say that I'm like I know everything about every tribe or every tribal community, but what I know of is that um, we didn't um, look at sexuality, or we didn't look at two-spirit people. Um, it wasn't about sex. It's about culture and spirituality because we played community roles before colonization. So when the Europeans and the missionaries came in, they looked at us as um, perverts. I mean, I'm just simply going to say that. And so what they did was they began to murder our people, uh, they forced um, their beliefs upon our, our people. And so today, a lot of our um, uh, Two-Spirit people struggle um, because we're still looked down upon. Um, and that's really, really sad. I always like to tell the story, too, um, as a therapist. Um, I was asked to work with a Dakota woman who was 70 years old. And her coach um, went to her and said, um, would you be willing to sit with Lenny? And her first question was, is he gay? Um, and the coach person uh, said, does that matter? And her response was, I don't want to talk to him. I mean, I wasn't hurt by that, um, you know, because sometimes I just, as a therapist, we don't work for every individual that we uh, connect with or come in contact with. And so, what that told me, too, was also coming from the Dakota tribe and where I'm from, I'm Dakota, um, her understanding of my identity as a uh, two-spirit individual is lost because, um, you know, she didn't understand. And that is how uh, the impact of historical trauma is on our community when even our elders don't um, remember so here's the, one of the famous pictures also of two-spirit people who were thrown in a pit by Spaniards. Um, and they were, a lot, they were um, eaten alive by a pack of dogs. Um, so this is what happened. This is what history tells us about my ancestors um, who identify. So as a mental health therapist, this is one of the pieces that I like to talk with. Um, I've had the, um, the honor um, to sit with many, many um, two-spirit individuals, Native, uh, Native LGBTQ individuals in different capacities. And one of them was um, being a uh, co-facilitator of a two-spirit support group. And what has really, you know, impacted me by talking with these individuals and also talking with individuals outside of that group, but in community, um, spending time with people. These are some of the things that, um, the issues that really impact our community. And one of the things I talk about is the loss of Native identity and loss of culture. Um, what I know of is that a lot of our uh, Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ people um, migrate from the reservation to urban community because they know that there's LGBTQ organizations that, that support them. But the struggle and challenge is that a lot of these LGBTQ organizations do not understand what it means to be Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ. So 
sometimes they don't know how to work with individuals. And so that's what makes it really, really difficult. And that's one of the reasons why I advocated so much for this uh, support group in Minneapolis. Um, and it's still going on. I've had to take a step back from being a part of that, uh, facilitating that group due to um, other work. Uh, but I still stay connected with individuals in the community, still have conversation with them. Um, so one of the other things that I talk about is loss of culture. Um, and I've seen it. I've experienced it. I did not grow up in culture. Um, what I know of from individuals is that two-spirit males and females who have wanted to sweat, uh, go into the sweat lodge in their native communities were often shunned and turned away, um, which is really, really sad because we did play a huge part in ceremony before colonization. Um, and so I have seen individuals from South Dakota who have traveled to Minnesota to actually who identify who have actually come to Minnesota just to be a part of ceremony. Um, and that's really, really sad. I mean, that disconnection from culture um, um, and spirituality. What I want to remind everyone who's on the call that I do want to specify that not every person who identifies as Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ are impacted by a lot of these issues. Um, so it's really important to remember that because I do not want to place labels on individuals or uh, uh, issues. So I'm specifically talking about myself and also talking about individuals who I've connected with. Um, but I do hear stories across the country um, in regards to the issues that impact the community. Um, one of the things that we know of, too, is that our young people who identify um, either as Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ are being impacted by sex and human trafficking. I'm going to go into detail a little bit more, too, on the next webinar. But what we know of is that um, what I know of and what I've seen is a, lo a lot of our young people are really connected to the words that we use today, like gender fluid, um, um, gender queer, queer, which is a good thing, um, and it's OK. What I also know of is that a lot of our young people uh, do not have a really true uh, understanding of what that two-spirit identity means because of the disconnection of um, culture and spirituality. And so what I've also seen is that the older people, people around my age, um, are really connected to that two-spirit identity. And that's okay. But we also have adults, too, who do not connect to that two-spirit uh, identity, but would, ra would rather call themselves a native LGBTQ, and that's all okay. So I, I really, really want to be clear about that. Um, what I also know of, too, is that I was um, brought, to, brought to the attention by an FBI agent in South Dakota who told me that they know that uh, there was trafficking of two-spirit native LGBTQ youth from Minnesota to South Dakota back and forth. So we know what's happening. The sad part about it is that um, one of the things I've been advocating across the country is that we don't have specific data uh, that indicates a lot of this, these issues that are impacting the community because we're so intertwined with the mainstream data. Um, I have many times have asked that question at conferences, uh, talking to individuals who, who um, uh, collect data, LGBTQ data, and one of the questions I was asked is how much of that data is Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ data? Most of the time they don't answer me, they ignore me. So there's a huge need for collecting data. Um, so what we are using today, this was data that was done by Dr. Krina Walters, the Honors Project, and you can actually Google it. Uh, there's still articles that are still journal articles that are coming out from this study. But what she did with her team was that she went to the six largest two-spirit urban communities in the United States and collected this data. What we know of today, and this data, uh, I believe the first, I could be wrong, um, so don't quote me, but I believe that the first uh, journal article came out in 2008. Um, and so, 
we are still having to use this data, and I talk a lot with my colleagues about this data, and we all agree that that data is probably much more higher today than it was in 2008, or when she uh, started this research. Um, because like my experience in working with individuals, uh, adult individuals, I, almost every individual that I've worked with has, um, has had many experiences in um, child physical abuse, child sexual abuse, lifetime of sexual assault. Um, one of the things that I'm really impacted too, what really got me into this work was I was asked to um, uh, do a, be a part of a focus group with a Native organization in Minneapolis. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to collect data in regards to um, violence. Well, not collect data, but to have conversation about violence in the Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ community. So there was 15 individuals that showed up to this focus group. I'm, and even today, I mean, this was like four or five years ago, um, I'm still saddened by the, the thought that 14 out of 15 of those individuals reported being sexually assaulted as children and as, a, as an adult and didn't report it. So that's why uh, personally and professionally, I believe that that data today that you see on the screen is probably much more higher, the impact of violence on the Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ community. But like I said, you can find that data, um, uh, Google it, um, if you are, are interested in learning about the Honors Project. Um, but here's some facts. Um, nearly 80 countries criminalize homosexuality. And in the United States, 29 states can fire two-spirit LGBTQ people. Uh, in the U.S., 34 states can fire transgender people. Uh, Same-sex marriage was passed across the country. It does not impact tribes because they are not, because they're their own sovereign nation. Isn't that crazy? So I always tell people when same-sex marriage passed, I was happy for about a minute and that was it. Um, because our own tribal communities are our own sovereign nation. Um, so we get to make our rules and our laws in regards. And so what I like to talk about too is that, you know, I've been with my partner for seven years now. And um, I could never go home to my tribe and marry him and have it recognized. I could marry him in Minnesota, and if we ever moved to the tribe um, where I'm from, my marriage to him would not be recognized. And that's really, really sad. So from my understanding, I could be wrong, but this is the last time I heard. Over, with over 560-some tribes, 27 tribes have banned same-sex marriage. Or there's only 27 tribes who will allow same-sex uh, marriage. There's 13 tribes that have banned same-sex marriage. So that is a huge, huge impact on our community. When it's been told that Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ people um, have been have been married for thousands of years, or, or we're getting married in their tribal communities for a thousand years, and that is the impact of colonization um, that has changed so many different our ways of thinking and how we view Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ people. Um, I'm very passionate in this work because I do want to see change in our communities. But also, too, you know, really remembering if you want to be really inclusive to our community, what does that look like? Does that mean just ab adding the 2S to the LGBTQ? Or does it really mean like truly understanding what it means to be two-spirit? Because for me, like I said earlier, it goes much deeper um, because it's my connection to culture and spirituality. And I didn't know about two-spirit identity. Um, when I moved to Minneapolis 20 years ago, um, I heard the word two-spirit. And so what I did was I connected with some people in the community and actually had conversation with individuals about that term and what does it mean? So 
over the you know the next couple years um, I really wanted to truly get an understanding of that word and who am I you know and so today even today after all the study that I've done um, being able to sit with people and talk with people I really connect with that um, I'm trying to get away from that colonized way of thinking um, so that's why I identify as a winkta, which was the word that was given to me by my tribal community. And then the second, I call myself a two-spirit male. And then the third is calling myself a gay male. So for me, that's really empowering of who I am. Um, there's a question. How many tribes have accepted same-sex marriage? So with my understanding, like I said earlier, there's only 27 tribes that have allowed same-sex marriage. 13 tribes have banned same-sex marriage. Um, so could you imagine over 560-some tribes, um, how many of our people can't get married and, and they have it recognized? Um, so, you know, it's a lot to think about. It's a lot of, uh, to grasp, grasp upon. Um, you know, what I also know of, too, is that a lot of our young people, like I said earlier, are really disconnected from that term, two-spirit. So I feel an obligation and a responsibility to, I don't want to force them to use that term, but I really want them to know um, that there is some Native identity out there because um, I think there is a disconnection. Um, I don't think that we have done a job, a very good job of talking about two-spirit identity with our young people, um, especially with individuals who are a part of the foster care system or um, there's, there's just a huge disconnection. I do have to say though, um, in the five, six years, seven years I've been doing this work, I have seen it grow, I have seen it um, um, being talked about more. We do have uh, two-spirit societies across the country who are doing amazing, amazing um, things for our community um, with that connection of culture and spirituality and ceremony. Um, so I'm really, really happy about that. I'm also happy, too, that even in South Dakota, um, being a part of a Wink Day group um, where we just want to be in South Dakota and we want to connect with all the tribes in South Dakota, because the thing is that we want to be present. We want people to see us because the people who are stuck in the closet um, aren't able to come out, are not safe to come out. Those are the people that we should be connecting with. And so I often think about all of our young people, um, especially in foster care, if we're not um, properly teaching them, or if we are using homophobic slurs in the home, that child is not going to come out. It's, uh, that child is also going to be um, um, traumatized, uh, maybe possible mental health issues in the future, um, may have the issues that I showed earlier um, in regards to the issues that impact our community. So we really need to think about that. Um, so um, I can only hope and pray that things are going to be different, because they are going to be different. I believe that. It may take some time. One of the things I also like to uh, remind people, too, is that um, when we talk about how historical and intergenerational trauma has impacted the two-spirit community, it probably hasn't been until the last 10 years. And it all began with the work and research of Dr. Prina Walters. So we're just now beginning to talk about that. So can you imagine, you know, um, we've been talking about historical trauma, but now we're talking about uh, how historical and intergenerational trauma has impacted this community. Um, so, you know, things are getting better. Um, I'm always reminded, too, I have a really good colleague of mine um, who always says to me, you know, and it's, it sounds funny, I mean, it's something to laugh about, and I often chuckle about it, and I'm reminded of that. But one of these things he always says to me is, he always says, Lenny, you're always talking about the bad things in our community. He said, but you have to remember that there's good things going on in our community also. And that's true. Um, and so I'm always reminded of that. And um, 
But the reality of it is that it can be much better. Um, I advocate across the country, uh, specifically talking about my community, you know, really, really challenging people. What is that inclusive? What does that inclusiveness look like? Um, you know, and I, I talk about another time, because um, I was a part of the Minnesota Two-Spirit Society. I was um, the chairman of the board, and we had received a grant. And there had to have been like 150 people um, in the community um, at the event. And there was only three or four of us that were brown people. Um, and it was so uncomfortable to see the LGBTQ plastered right in front of our face um, and that disconnection of two-spirit identity and not being included. Um, so really think about that, um, how we're impacted. And, you know, because some of us do disconnect from that mainstream LGBTQ identity. Um, so, it's, you know, it's just really important to um, think about that. Um, it's sad. I mean, we're impacted um, in many, many different ways. This is just a beginning conversation. Um, so, question. I wonder if the tribes who haven't banned or endorsed it just follow the laws of the particular state. Well, um, I can only assume that a lot of tribal communities um, are still very judgmental about Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ people. And so I, and this is just my opinion, um, but it's good to have conversations with other individuals who identify. But I often think that there is so much, there's, there's just so much homophobia in our tribal communities that um, often we're just looked down upon. And people aren't willing to have that conversation. Um, I'm happy when I hear that, that tribes do pass same-sex marriage. But I'm also disappointed in tribes that have same-sex marriage but don't talk about it. I mean, I've done some research here in Minnesota in which I heard there were several tribes who um, allow same-sex marriage, but why are you not talking about it? I mean, that's a huge impact. So I think a lot of it is our own personal biases. Um, and I'm always respectful in how people believe and stuff, but often too, um, I think that um, we're, almost treated in a way that we're dehumanized um, because we're looked down upon so badly in some tribal communities and some areas. So that's why I said a lot of our uh, people that, you know, who are my colleagues, my friends, they're doing some amazing work to, you know, to create some change in our communities. Um, and like truly understanding how colonization has really impacted our community um, when History tells us we were highly respected, um, but I'm but I'm always going to stress when I tell people, it's really important to remember to ask an individual, how do you identify? We can't place labels on individuals, and we can't make assumptions, because assumptions always get us into trouble. Um, like I said earlier, too, I mean. We're not sexual people. It's not about sex. It's about that connection, the culture and spirituality. But that is how colonization changed our way of thinking. The colonizers looked at us as sexual beings that were doing bad things. Our people before colonization, our, our communities did not see us in that way. They seen us in a way that was connected to spirituality because we were part of ceremony. Um, so I'm going to stress that, always to remember that. Um, so here is a, a comment. To speak to the marriage issues on Celeste and Choose 
My tribe has legalized gay marriage, but most of the members don't know anything about 2S or gay indigenous people and can be, and can be quite homophobic and transphobic due to the latent Christian influences. I agree with that, um, <clears throat> but I also want to be respectful in the way that people, because um, we do have uh, our native communities that are connected to that Christian identity. Um, I always say to people, um, be respectful in how I believe, and I will be respectful to the way you believe. Um, because as a child, um, if you heard in my video, um, people who were being a part of the system, they were more interested in my sexual identity rather than the trauma that I experienced. Um, and so being a part of boarding school and being a part of a, a group home where it was run by Catholics, um, just adults telling me that I was going to go to hell because of who I am. And um, it's really hard not to be angry. Um, but I do have a right to be angry because people pushed things on me that should have never been pushed on me. And so a lot of the things was just the biases that people have their own biases um, that really influenced my way of thinking. So even today, I mean, I still struggle with Christianity. Um, I have family members who are connected to it. Um, I've been sort of, um, they pushed their beliefs on me until I finally just spoke up and said, you know, um, respect the way that I believe and I'll respect the way you believe. Because for me right now, through my healing journey, being connected to culture and spirituality has changed me tremendously. It has, it has helped me to find out who I am, my identity as a Native person, um, learning about values, learning about ceremonies, um, helping people um, in many different ways. Um, that's who I am. Um, so my view of Christianity is different than it was 20, 30 years ago. Um, you know, I don't have to feel bad about who I am. I just grasp onto that beautiful identity of a two-spirit male um, and, and try to walk in a good way. Um, I mean, we can have more conversation. Um, you know, about all of this, it goes much deeper than just an hour and a half webinar. But one of the things that I do, too, is I go across the country talking about violence in the community, um, many, many different forms of violence. Um, so the next five people that I'm going to talk about are five individuals from my tribe. Um, I have permission to show their pictures. I have permission to talk about them from their families because their families want everyone to know the violence that uh, that occurs in the Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ community. Um, so I do have permission to talk about them. This is my friend Jared. Uh, Jared and I were in high school together, um, grew up together. Um, I left a reservation 20 years ago. Um, he stayed on a reservation. Um, Jared struggled a lot with chemical dependency issues. Um, and it was hard. It was hard for him um, to live on a reservation. And so um, Jared was um, our first victim. And what happened to Jared was he was stabbed multiple times by an individual or individuals. Um, there was blunt force trauma done to his body. Um, today, they have not yet found his killer. Um, and the five individuals I'm going to talk about, it's just over a two-year span. And these are individuals from my tribe. This is Dallas. Um, I know his aunt, um, and I'm really good friends with her. I actually call her my sister. Um, but Dallas, um, I, always, I asked her just recently, how did Dallas identify? 
um, she had told me that Dallas identified as a transgender. So on the picture of the right with the little boy, um, what I find beautiful about this story is that Dallas and a female two-spirit wanted to have a child together. And so, um, so this is his little boy. Um, I don't know today, I mean, I know that the aunt told me that um, Dallas identified as, as transgender. So I go back and forth. Um, I try to remember to call her, Dallas say her. But what had happened was Dallas got into an argument with uh, her brother in the basement of the grandmother's house. And the brother stabbed um, Dallas to death. Sad. Um, and this is Vernon. I love to talk about Vernon in a sense that I, I like to call Vernon a true Winkta. Um, he was a sun dancer. Um, he helped his people. He was actually, and what, what I was really proud of too was that he was also one of the co-founders of the first Two-Spirit Society in South Dakota, um, which was a system locked in Oyate. And so I was very proud of his accomplishments. I remember um, um, there were many times that he would reach out to me and want to have conversation. And one of the things he said to me was um, he wanted to know more about Two-Spirit people. He wanted to know more about Winkta identity. Um, he did work towards trying to get uh, marriage recognized within our tribe, say same-sex marriage. Um, you know, having conversations with people. So I had a, uh, so I have a lot of respect for Vernon. Um, so Vernon's situation was that he, it was called a domestic violence situation because he was a driver for three other girls um, and they went back to one of the females' homes. Um, one of the females was um, uh, part of a uh, domestic violence uh, relationship. So there was there was some things that happened. Well, her partner, her male partner, came out and shot them. Um, Dallas, um, I mean, Vernon um, was shot multiple times. Um, his family was concerned that it was a hate crime because of um, he was shot more than the other individuals. But how he was shot was um, uh, unacceptable. Any, any. Uh, shots like that are unacceptable, but the but he the killer the shooter also ended up um, killing himself. So you can only imagine how much grief and how much anger and uh, my whole tribe was impacted by this. Um, but like I said, I had I have the utmost respect for Vernon. I just think about the good things that he's done for our people within tribal community. Um, this is our youngest victim, Ayana. Um, Ayana uh, publicly spoke um, about being bullied and how we should treat one another. Ayana also identified as gender fluid. Um, so I've seen pictures of her as her male identity and a female identity. Um, so with Ayana, uh, three months after she made that public appearance about talking about bullying and how we how we treat people, um, Ayana committed suicide. Um, we don't know why she committed suicide because she didn't leave a note. Um, we can only assume, but um, she she never left a story or never said why she did what she did. But we shouldn't have young people like this um, commit suicide. Um, we need better services uh, for young people um, in helping them. Um, so I'm always sad when I talk about Ayana. Uh, this is Raina. Um, her situation um, was that uh, she was in jail in Watertown, South Dakota. She had asked um, the jail for mental health help. Um, and the jail turned her down. Um, it was reported that uh, when they went to check on her, she had hung herself, uh, committed suicide in her cell. So she's another individual that I'm really saddened by in the fact that she wasn't provided uh, services 
for she asked for help um, but they just did not help her I know that there's some legal issues that are pending so um, I hope that everything turns out with her family in regards to uh, getting justice um, but I really really want people to think about you know how my community is so impacted by many different forms of violence and it doesn't mean I mean words are violent too um, shaming an individual because of who they are is is, is um, violent and so really think about nationally when I talk about the LGBTQ mainstream how we are also are not a part of that LGBTQ um, and these are my own personal words. Um, you can always have conversations with individuals who identify, but this is what I have seen and felt. Um, you know, we are often forgot about. I mean, look at all the data that's out there in regards to sex and human trafficking of our young people, um, domestic violence. Um, how much of that data, I always ask that question, how much of that data is Native uh, Two-Spirit individuals? And, it could never be answered. So we need to create some change. I mean, we need to create space in, um, in getting our community identified um, or being included, um, even within tribal communities. So like I said earlier, we have a lot of good people who are doing amazing work. Um, we just got to keep moving forward. And that's what I'm happy about. So, let us not forget the other missing and murdered Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ individuals from across the country, because we know that there's individuals who are missing, um, who aren't accounted for. Um, so let us remember them. So this quote is from Beverly Little Thunder, and it was amazing when we were putting this together, and this has always been one of my favorite quotes. Um, I did not realize that it, um, this, in, this quote comes from this amazing elder, uh, Beverly, who I've had the privilege of sitting with um, several times, I've had conversation with, but this is her quote, um, so it just blew me out of the water. But the pain of being rejected by one's own people can be the most devastating. Um, there's, there's truth to that. Um, so. I think what I'm going to do is um, we're coming to the last 15 minutes, I believe. So here is my contact information. I know that um, I wish that I can spend more time talking about this. Um, I'm hoping that you'll be able to attend our next conversation when we talk about uh, two-spirit youth in foster care um, and how to be a, a better relative to them. Um, here's my contact information. Please send me an email. But I think I'm going to open it up. Um, is there any more questions that people would like to ask? I know this is kind of quick, um, but I really want to, you know, put it out there for questions. And Money, I just want to remind folks, I know we have a few participants who are only connected using their telephone. So for those that are, um, please feel free to unmute your line and press star six if you wanted to speak up and ask anything or share anything. Okay, let me look at this question here. Can you speak at all about treatment or inclusion of Native folks that are born with biological, natural, intersex conditions or variations, meaning chromosomal and genital differences where someone might not fit into the typical gender binary? or male or female or reach uh, typical puberty. Um, from my understanding um, in talking with some several uh, elders, when we had individuals like that in community, um, I also like to talk about too when we had individuals who may have had um, uh, mental health issues or uh, you know may have been born with Down syndrome, our people treated them with the utmost respect and honor. They were considered sacred. 
And so our people took care of them. Um, I have also heard stories of um, mothers knowing that their child was different and that wasn't a bad thing. I've heard of ceremonies and celebrations. But one specifically, there was a tribe that actually, what they did was they put on a male and female object and they allowed that child to pick that male or female object and whatever they picked, that's how they raised the child. Um, which is amazing because they went by the child's choice. Um, like I said earlier, yes, we had individuals who we would identify today as transgender, but we had no specific word that would call them transgender or LGBTQ because our people accepted and loved us so much that there was no such words like that. Um, there was no um, struggle and challenge about sexuality. I mean, um, like I said, we were s such a huge part of um, um, community. Um, there's been also told of stories that some two-spirit camps were outside of the huge camp, which wasn't a bad thing either because community, the leaders or people in the community would actually come to the two-spirit camp and would talk with them, um, talk with the two-spirit people and, you know, about ceremony or anything like that. But it wasn't a bad thing for us to be outside of our tribal community or, you know, uh, our camp. Um, so, but sometimes people view that as being bad, but that wasn't a bad thing. Because um, I thought that the first time I heard that and then the more that I had conversation with elders, it wasn't a bad thing. Um, it was highly respected. I mean, we were respected so much that people actually came into our camp and would talk to us. So I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, do we have any, is there any more other questions? I mean, I hope that was helpful. I mean, you know, there needs to be more research that needs to be done. I will, I will repeat that once again. Looks like someone is typing a question. While some folks are typing, if others have questions or want to unmute again, just a reminder, you can press star six on your phone. But I wanted to share that that um, register for this webinar information for the Supporting Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ Youth, you can click right on that from your webinar screen. Um, that webinar is going to take place on July 18th, and Lenny will be joined by Sandy Whitehawk. Um, so please feel free to register for that and continue the conversation with Lenny um, that way. His contact info, website email are also clickable links. And the Learn More is a resource list that Lenny helped the um, Center for Tribes create that includes the guide that one of our participants shared in the chat, um, the Tribal Equity Toolkit, along with um, quite a few more resources that Lenny thought were helpful for those who work with um, Two-Spirit and Native LGBTQ youth or who may work with Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ youth. And again, you can click on that right from your screen here too. Um, after the webinar, we are going to send out an evaluation via email, and I can include that resource list in the email as well. Um, but it looks like there's one more question, Lenny, for you. Um, are you aware of any college or universities that are doing well at supporting Native LGBTQ two-spirit students? Um, I have heard of several colleges that are doing some uh, amazing work. Um, I had the opportunity to do some work with the University of Texas um, to go down there to talk about two-spirit identity. Um, like I said, I mean, um, there is individuals who are much younger, who are more connected to the, the mainstream um, identity that we use today in regards to LGBTQ. And there's so many different labels that are being added um, so a lot of our young people are still trying to figure out or still trying to learn about two-spirit identity. We have some young people who 
call themselves two spirit or native LGBTQ, um, but it's that disconnection. And so that's where I said we as people need to continue to teach our young people about two spirit identity and what that means. Um, so um, yes, there is some college uh, universities that are doing some good stuff. Um, I just, I just really, really believe that we need to stop. We need to start talking more about two spirit identity and really understanding, sitting with our elders because that's how I learned. I learned from um, sitting with individuals, talking with individuals, but most of all, just being with elders within the community. I mean, there's several of them who I just love sitting with them and learning. And I'm not, like I said, I what I'm presenting today is not specifically for every tribe. It's more of a basic universal um, conversation. Um, so um, let me see. Let me see how I can see this. Uh, are there any non-tribal organizations that are doing a good job with native two-spirit LGBTQ policy and rights who can help support, especially in public schools? Well, I have to be honest and say no. Um, so I would really, really encourage people to take a look at that tr tribal equity report. Um, it's, it's very powerful. It's really good information. Um, but I have not heard anything of tribal organizations that are really supportive of Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ youth and adults. I mean, we're still trying to figure out how to um, help our people within um, uh, communities that are impact, impacted by domestic violence, um, shelters. Um, we're still having to train and talk with advocates and individuals on how to create a safe space for individuals who identify and who are experiencing domestic violence. Um, so we're still having to educate our communities. Um, it's just... I mean, I want a lot of good things to happen to our community, and there is, there is. I will say that again, there is, but it's not at the rate that I wished it was. But I had, I'm learning patience through this work. Um, so um, thank you. Um, thanks for the information and sharing your experience. I am not able to attend the next session. OK. Um, yes, it will be made available, I believe. The question was, um, it will be recorded, and if so, how will this be made available? So we are recording it, and we're going to post the recording to um, the Capacity Building Center for Tribes YouTube page, as well as the Tribal Information Exchange, which is um, a website that houses a lot of resources um, that we've gathered or created for tribal child welfare agencies and communities. Um, I'll share the link to that, but I'll also send an email out to everyone with the recording as well. And we would love for you to share it, watch it, post it on your sites, however you'd like to use it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lenny, for sharing with us and for your time today. And I look forward to our next webinar on July 18th. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.